us so now in part two of our interview. I asked the speaker about his agenda, how he plans to tackle our national debt and much more. Take a look. We talked a lot yesterday about this, this immigration bill, Syria and, and the refugee problem. You're now the new speaker of the House. I don't know why you took the job. I think your first instincts probably were right, Mr. Speaker. Don't take the job. I wouldn't. I don't think I'd ever want your job. You, you take this job where 60 percent of Republicans feel betrayed by Washington Republicans. The, the two big areas, Mr. Speaker, have to do with promises. One, repealing, replacing Obamacare. Two, the 2014 promise to stop executive illegal unconstitutional amnesty and Republicans never got it done and there's great anger among conservatives and the, what I keep hearing from them is why won't why won't the House Republicans use their enumerated constitutional power of the purse are you willing to go that far to fulfill promises do you feel responsible for past promises or do you want to hit the reset button well I, I think it's a little more complicated than that I think we need to put a check on power I, I have told people all along, we have to be a more effective opposition party. But that means using all the tools at our disposal, Sean. Um, we've gone to court, and the courts have been very successful in stopping the executive amnesty, for example. So I think we have to use all the tools at our disposal. But not the on Obamacare. Because the, 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 the power of the purse doesn't work on Obamacare. It's an entitlement. So we're, that's why we're using reconciliation. The Senate will be bringing As this bill passed, up next week. Right. So, so, so we're using the Budget Act for Obamacare because the power of the purse doesn't work because it's an entitlement. I don't know if you want me to go into the details, but the point but I'm trying to say is... there certain aspects that could have been defunded? There were parts of Obamacare that could have been defunded? Not the entitlement, but the, 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 what Obamacare is an entitlement. That's right. the guts of Obamacare, and that requires 60 votes in the Senate, except if you put it in a budget. So we did this. We've already passed this out of the House. We've passed a number of repeals, and we passed through the budget. The Senate's taking it up next week. So we're using the one crack we have once a year to avoid a filibuster in the Senate, and we're using it for Obamacare. So the, I think the, the frustration that I believe, believe me as a House member feel is that the Senate, you can't pass everything you want to pass because they can filibuster all but one bill. And that's the frustration out there. But here's the other key thing, Sean. We have to show people what we stand for. We have to show people we don't like the track we're on in this country. We think the president has taken the, the country in the, in the direct wrong direction, in the exact wrong direction. So we need to show people who we are and what we believe in. What would we replace Obamacare with? What's a new tax system look like? What does a limited government look like? How do we re recover the separation of powers? How do we rebuild our military? How do we have a foreign policy that keeps America safe, that advances our interests? We can't run on vague platitudes. We have to have a specific, coherent agenda and then let the people in this country choose which path they want to take. And I think after eight years of Obama, they're not going to have four more years of a progressive president. And so one of the conditions on which I took the speakership is I will do this if we put an agenda out there, if we go on offense, on ideas, and if we give the people of this country the election they deserve, which is let them decide what kind of country they want to have, what kind of future they want to have. Are we going to tackle the debt? Are we going to take on these issues? And that is what we're going to do in 2016. You and know, so, yes, I have, I have commitments. Um, I mean, we have issues that are being dealt with at the end of the year here. But what I'm most looking forward to is going on offense in 2016 and bringing a coherent, productive, exciting, inspiring, conservative agenda to the country. You know, it's interesting you say all this because I've been suggesting this now since 2013. Yeah. In 2014, I laid out what I called the, the conservative solution caucus, and that would be balancing a budget, explaining to people how to do it. There might be differences, but we can get there. Uh, controlling our borders, choice in education, energy independence, and of course, a, a strong national defense. How do you do that? I, I, for example, I like the way Newt Gingrich did it. I was there in Georgia. I watched him become Speaker of the House. First time Republicans took power in 40 years. And every interview, he'd pull out of his pocket 10 items. Elect us. We'll do this in 100 days. I think that's the model. I think I don't know what we'll call it exactly. This is going to be a, a bottom-up uh, organic process. I'm also not going to have a top-down speakership. I want the members of Congress to have an equal say-so and to be part of an effort of a movement here. And I think Newt created a good model. That's point one. Point two, one of the reasons I think people asked me to be speaker, which I wasn't looking for this, I was not a person in elected leadership, I wasn't making these decisions in the past, is because I'm a policy leader and because what I did with my budgets. I put out a budget in 2008 that had eight sponsors, eight supporters, balancing the budget, reforming entitlements, doing tax reform, uh, all of those things. I put it all on the line and we've been able to pass it last the last four years. 
but I started with eight supporters because nobody wanted to touch the political third rail that they thought it was. And so because I have walked the walk in addition to talking the talk, I think that's why people ask me to step up and be speaker. And that's what I want our conference to do on all of these big issues. And welcome to Hannity tonight. ISIS is right here on American soil. The House Homeland Security chairman says there are now 1,000 investigations into the terror group spread out across all 50 states. And today, ISIS allegedly released a brand new video showing jihadists promising more attacks in France and vowing to blow up the White House. Now, this all comes in the wake of reports earlier today that two Syrian families were detained along our southern border in Laredo, Texas. Now, U.S. authorities are saying that there are no known terror ties but it shows just how easy it would be for terrorists to enter into the homeland. Now, despite all of this, President Obama is flat out ignoring the real threats, and instead, well, he's focusing on attacking Republicans. Watch this. When individuals say that we should have a religious test and that only Christians, proven Christians, should be admitted, that's offensive and contrary to American values. I cannot... Think of a more, uh, more potent recruitment tool for ISIL than some of the rhetoric that's been coming out of here. Now, first they were worried about the press being too tough on them during debates. Now they're worried about three-year-old orphans. That doesn't sound very tough to me. And that's not all. President Obama continues to spew dangerous rhetoric about the Syrian refugees. Watch this. The idea that somehow um, they pose a more significant threat than all the tourists who pour into the United States every single day uh, just doesn't jive with reality. That's not what our law enforcement thinks. And here now with Reaction 2016 GOP presidential candidate, Texas Senator Ted Cruz. Senator, I think when the president was talking about the religious test, which is offensive and contrary to our values and a recruitment tool, he was talking about you. And I want to get your reaction to that. Well, you know, it really is remarkable that, that twice this week President Obama has attacked me directly. Uh, and, and both times he's done so from foreign soil, first in Turkey, uh, where he called me un-American. Uh, and then in Manila, uh, where, where he said I was offensive. And, and apparently what he deems offensive is what you and I and millions of Americans have been saying, which is that the Obama-Clinton plan to bring in tens of thousands of Syrian Muslim refugees to America is utter lunacy. At a time when ISIS has declared war, at a time when radical Islamic terrorists want to murder as many Americans as possible, at a time when the Obama administration admits it can't vet these refugees, the head of the FBI said they lack the information to be able to ascertain whether these refugees are in fact ISIS terrorists, it is the essence of reasonableness and common sense to say we shouldn't be bringing in tens of thousands of refugees who may include ISIS Senator. terrorists. And yet Obama, instead of defending this nation, just attacks you and me and every American who wants to keep this nation safe. You know, he just said that this is no dangerous than any tourist coming to America. Now, I'm going to play for you Obama's top envoy in the coalition to defeat ISIS. That's uh, General John Allen. And I'll play for you the FBI director, uh, James Comey, mm -hmm. and the assistant director, yeah. Steinbeck, and the national intelligence director, James Clapper. They're all saying that ISIS will very likely infiltrate the refugee community, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is exactly, exactly what they did in France. And he says, no different than a tourist. I want to play it for you and our audience so they know what our intelligence officers are saying about this. Right, right, right. Would that uh, bring in Syrian refugees pose a greater risk to Americans? I mean, it, it's clearly a population of concern. The concern is in Syria, the lack of our footprint on the ground in Syria, that the databases won't have the information we need. So it's not that we have a lack of process, it's there's a lack of information. And, and, and that, that obviously raises grave concern as to being able to do uh, proper background checks of the individuals coming into the country. Yes. I don't obviously uh, put it past uh, the likes of ISIL to infiltrate operatives uh, among these uh, refugees. We can only query against that which we have collected. And, and so if someone has never made a ripple in the pond in Syria in a way that would get their identity or their interests reflected in our database, we can query our database till the cows come home, but we're, we're not going to 
will, there will be nothing show up because we have no record on that person. There is some fear, some fear that some of these refugees may actually be posing as refugees, but they might actually be Al Qaeda or ISIS terrorists uh, trying to sneak into Europe or the United States. What do you make of that? Well, certainly that's a possibility. I mean, uh, there, you, you can't uh, you can't dismiss that out of hand. We should be uh, conscious of the potential that uh, Daesh may attempt to embed uh, agents uh, within that, po that population. You know, S Senator, if the president refuses to listen to our top law yeah. enforcement and intelligence yeah. community, yeah. it seems to me he is willing to gamble with the lives of the American people. How can this be stopped? You know, Sean, you, you are exactly right. This president is so driven by radical ideology, by political correctness. I mean, remember, this is a president who refuses to say the words radical Islamic terrorism, just like Hillary Clinton in the Democratic debate. She could not utter the words radical Islamic terrorism. If they won't define the enemy, then they don't acknowledge the simple reality that they can't vet whether the people they're bringing in are terrorists, and, 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 and it is profoundly dangerous. Now, you ask, what can we do about it? I am leading the fight in the Senate to stop Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's plan to bring in tens of thousands of Syrian Muslim refugees. Today, I went to the Senate floor and brought forward two pieces of legislation I've introduced. The first is the Expatriate Terrorist Act. This is common sense legislation that says if an American citizen goes and joins ISIS, if he takes up arms against America and wages jihad against this nation, that by doing so, he or she loses their American citizenship. We shouldn't have ISIS terrorists coming back to America using U.S. passports in order to then wage jihad and try to murder innocent Americans. The second legislation is legislation that I've introduced that would block Syrian refugees and refugees from Iraq and from Libya from coming over nations where Al-Qaeda and ISIS control large portions of territory. It would block those refugees from coming in so that we don't expose ourselves to the national security risk. Now listen, there's a humanitarian crisis, but these refugees can be resettled in the Middle East in majority Muslim countries. We're already providing, we're paying more of that bill than any country on earth, and yet the president insists we have to endanger the safety so, and security of our nation. And I'll tell you what, Sean, when I brought both of these up on the Senate floor, the Senate Democrats stood up and objected. You know, Pat Leahy echoed President Obama's attack. He said it was anti-American, and he said, gosh, his ancestors were Irish and Italian, and we didn't block them. And I responded to Pat Leahy. I said, you know what? On my mother's side, my ancestors were Irish and Italian. The difference was they weren't coming here to blow up and murder innocent civilians. And if the Democrats can't tell the difference between immigrants coming, the huddled masses yearning to breathe free, and people who may be radical Islamic terrorists, that's what's wrong with the, Senator, the Obama foreign policy in the first place. It, it, there's something that I think too few people are willing to have an honest discussion about, and that is yeah. there is a clash yeah. of cultures. In other words, the, the values of people that grow mm -hmm. up, for example, under Sharia law, if that's what you grew up under and you yep. think women yep. shouldn't be able to drive and women can't be seen in public without a male relative and you need mm -hmm. four male eyewitnesses for a woman to prove rape, and, and many countries practice Sharia, how do we ascertain whether or not you still hold those values but still want to live in yeah. America or maybe even more extreme values mm -hmm. there's no vetting process that I can think right. of that will right. ascertain right. what is in the human heart especially because terrorists aren't they trained to lie to people that would interview them if we're vetting uh, them uh, they, they are and indeed there is a religious philosophy in Islamism that encourages them to lie to carry out jihad and and you know, if you look at Islamism, it is a theocratic and political ideology that says that they are compelled to use violence and force to murder anyone that doesn't share their radical faith or to forcibly convert them. And, and it is a cancer. And we will not defeat radical Islamic terrorism unless and until we but have a commander in chief in, in, willing to say in those light words. Of, in light of the refugees, Senator, that committed these atrocities, these terror attacks in France, the Democrats seem like they're willing to gamble with the lives of Americans. Now, let's assume that one of the refugees, yeah. Yeah. you know, one of these ISIS members infiltrates the refugee population and they sure. do commit acts of terror. Who will have blood on their hands? 
Well, listen, we know they did that in Europe. We know that at least one of the terrorists who committed these horrible attacks in Paris came in with the refugees. And President Obama and Hillary Clinton and the Democrats are willing to allow those same refugees to come to come to our shores. And apparently they're willing to just roll the dice and 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 take the risk that hundreds or God forbid thousands of Americans will be murdered by jihadists. And you know, one of the things that's striking, Sean, you know what seemed to make President Obama the angriest? Is that I drew a distinction. <laughs> well, yes, but, but in particular that I drew a distinction and said there's a different circumstance for the Christians who are being persecuted, for the Christians who are facing genocide. You know, ISIS is crucifying Christians. They are beheading Christians. Well, he said they're we're no longer a Christian minority. nation, Senator, genocide. at one point. And he said okay. terrible deeds in the name of Christ. Can I, I want to play for you the... And, the, and I, he seems Christ. angrier by those of us who want to provide safe haven for the Christians being persecuted than he is at the attacks from ISIS. Why is it that this president is so opposed to standing up? Do you know of the current Syrian refugees? Only 3% of them are Christians. That's Why a, is the president unwilling to of defend the 2,184 Syrians that have already come in? Only three percent are Christian, 96 percent are Muslim. Yeah. Is this yeah. more pervasive radical Islam? And I only have 20 seconds here. I want to play a little bit of the the soccer game in the moment of silence in Istanbul. Mm -hmm. And instead of silence, the crowd started booing and and reports they were chanting Allahu Akbar. Let me play that for you, and and think mm -hmm. about. Is this a more pervasive mindset than the world is willing to acknowledge, meaning radical Islamists? Play this. That was supposed to be a moment of silence, Senator. Allahu Akbar, booing. Look, it is heartbreaking, it's dangerous, and as a consequence of the abject failures of the Obama-Clinton foreign policy, the Islamists are winning in many parts of the world. Right, the Obama-Clinton foreign policy toppled Libya, and radical Islamic terrorists took over. They toppled Mubarak in Egypt, and the Muslim Brotherhood took over. Their approach is undermining the safety and security.